what would you want yours to say? Oh my gosh, it's freaking deep. <laughs> um, <laughs> my life missions really is to be a light in, in people's lives. Uh, all right, so awesome. I'm Amanda Bender, the founder of Kilo, and I'm here with Amira Pollack, the founder and CEO of Sex Club. Yay, I'm so excited we're doing this. <laughs> I am too. Yeah, just to like introduce myself really quickly. Again, Amira, founder CEO of Struct Club. I I'm really excited to convene with other fellow founders and tech nerds in LA. I'm originally from LA. I was born in the Valley. I grew up in Glendale, another valley. Uh, and my, uh, for, for, I guess we're on video and people always ask me about just kind of background and heritage. My mom's from the Philippines. My dad's from a white Jewish family, uh, from the Bronx and they, they actually met at work. Um, and I have two little sisters. So I'm the eldest of three, just like a little bit about me and my background there. And then, uh, you know, with Struct Club, Struct Club is about bringing structure to music inspired fitness. So we've got an app where you can download it from the App Store uh, on any iOS device, your iPhone, your iPad, uh, iPod Touch, and you can grab workouts that go along with curated playlists that go all along to the beat, the structure of the music curated by professional coaches. And that's what we do. And you have told me in the past about how you were at school and you were a cycling instructor and how it took you a ton of time to put together your playlist and actually what you're coordinating. Will you just tell people a little bit about that? Because I was actually really fascinated by that part of the story because I too was a cycling instructor in college. I was like, that's such a wonderful problem to fix. That's so amazing. There are like so many secret <laughs> alias <laughs> instructors as well as other types of coaches, fitness coaches, people who have done that in the past. And I, I love that. Um, for me, I actually found my way to the world of fitness through music personally and growing up music was just such a, a gift to me as a child and just something that gave me so much happiness whether it was like playing a musical instrument or, or singing or, or dancing and you know just found my way through to motion through moving to the beat of the music and so as I became a cycling instructor um, through just falling in love with spinning classes anytime I was outside of work um, and my work in my earlier career was in technology so sometimes at software companies sometimes at hardware companies and sometimes in between by night I was going to be spin classes and all of them were set to music and I just when I was in grad school I was getting my MBA at uh, Harvard Business School and on the side picked up the hobby of becoming a spin instructor myself. I just wanted to dig in and dive deeper. And of course, any class that I was putting together had to be in sync with the music, um, the rhythm of the music, the structure of mm -hmm. the music, the flow of a playlist, all of those things. Uh, but I found like this was a problem that just smacked me in the face initially, like, whoa, this took a really long time to put together to choreograph this type of workout um, and really put that type of intention into a class. There are just so many things there to coordinate that I didn't appreciate um, before, even having come from a music and, and dance and even athletic background. It was really mm -hmm. quite a lot. And so Struck Club was born out of my own need and struggle to have one place to listen through my playlist one time to mark that up with any keynotes about the workout and then to have one source of truth when I was running class or teaching class for that to play back to me just to hit play have the music play out and then to have cues that come up about what we're doing when exactly how long what's coming up next uh, over the course of, of a workout so that's kind of yeah that's how it was born and I'm so interested because as you're talking, I feel like you have a very, very organized brain, which I love. <laughs> and so how did you <laughs> how did you first like how did you first design out or come up with the idea? Was it like at home with pieces of paper and you're writing it down? Was it 
on your computer? Was it talking to someone about the idea? How did it go from something in your head to something that was living and breathing? Yeah, I think it all starts with, you know, just kind of even for me, one of the critical like fire under my ass moments was when one of my students emailed me while I was away on a school trip and was really upset that I had brought in a substitute for my class but hadn't handed off the material sufficiently, um, which, you know, at that point in time was in the form of an email. I emailed out, like, here's some example playlists. They love a combination of 70s and 80s music. And, um, you know, Monday is the day that we focus on power output. Tuesday is the day that we focus, da, 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 da. And I, mm -hmm. I thought I had conveyed that out. And um, it turned out that I, you know, I came back from my trip and more than half of my clients were gone. Uh, and mm -hmm. a lot of them were upset because of just the lack of, um, consistency there. And so, you know, even the first form of taking it from just something from a concept or a problem uh, and, and an idea to something that was material was even that customer testimonial. I know people like when they start to get into the product journey, they're like, okay, like put together some paper mock-ups and some wireframes and they're like great tools for um, then taking that into a clickable mock-up format, whether it's like Figma or, or Sketch or balsamic or envision or like all types of products like that where you can kind of build a free app to bring into usability testing but actually mm -hmm. it started like even way 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 simpler than that it was really like naming the problem and naming a type of solution and coming up with an idea for that um that was literally like on paper um mm -hmm. and a value proposition that was verbalized sometimes we don't really think about that value proposition and that, that need, that job to be done, as Clayton Christensen calls it, um, before we even think about product, because there are actually many ways to manifest. You could have, you know, something that isn't even an app. It's not even software. You could, like, come up with a solution, like Zumba or Les Mills is another solution. It's it's mm -hmm. a different type of choreography, and it comes in the form of, of videos and training and certifications for those instructors to standardize that practice or there's different in-house training that gyms or studios offer to make sure their instructors have uh, you know like soul cycle has something like a six week long training program or in some cases mm -hmm. an instructor has a lot of experience that can be condensed to three weeks for some instructors that i've known so a lot of ways to tackle that that job or that issue to be done doesn't necessarily have to be a product maybe it's a service but mm -hmm. you have to you have to name and write down the problem and name and write down the solution. Mm -hmm. You just took me back, Les Mills, 24-Hour Fitness, Ocean Park, Los Angeles, <laughs> doing the barbell work in the class. I love those classes. It was great. So tell me, what do you find beautiful about being a founder? Ooh, there are, there are so many things. Um, when it comes down, so for, for me, when it comes to, it, it, again, it goes back to kind of that problem solution theme. When it comes to um, you know, helping people out and solving a problem, I think that there is something really magical that happens for, at least for me and, and a lot of entrepreneurs that I know, when somebody tells you that your, your product or your service has made a difference in their life and they, was, they were more than happy to pay for it and they feel that in doing that, they're actually supporting your mission and supporting your business. That's just like an amazing uh, and kind of magical and, and also financially sustainable symbiosis. So when people tell us when they've done workouts with Struct Club and, and since, you know, kind of the backstory that I've mentioned, we've expanded um, beyond focusing on instructors to also delivering workout experiences to consumers in general, mm -hmm. anybody who wants to work out and find fitness through music. And when people tell me, wow, because I wasn't focusing on a video of somebody who was way skinnier than I could ever achieve in two weeks or who was more built than even I necessarily might want to be at all, um, I could focus on my body and I could feel different about my body. That's mm -hmm. something that I think is really incredible. So, um, you know, those are the types of um, testimony. And, and 
for sure, people find other types of, of results, like kind of typical fitness results uh, around, say, having had a more effective workout or you know, maybe they were doing things like tracking their workout with a heart rate monitor and they were finally able to get to a next level that they weren't able to achieve before. I mean, those are just many different manifestations of what can be beautiful about um, taking an idea and bringing it to life for real people and, and doing something for them. Um, there are definitely many magical moments about um, building a team. Uh, we have an incredible team at Struck Club that I just feel fortunate to work with every day that centers our work around our core values of authenticity, impact, and inclusion. Um, so getting to shape that uh, and getting to see that come to life. I love employing people. <laughs> I really like all of the people. Um, and that just that's really cool. Uh, bringing a product or a service to life for sure is is a ton of fun. Um, and then, you know, when it comes to, people ask me a lot as well, and especially lately about uh, female founders, venture back female founders. Um, and when it comes to the finances of startup, really like uh, the, the biggest billionaires uh, in actually like all of them on that list, like the top billionaires list, they made their wealth through equity. Mm -hmm. And don't realize that they're like oh I really want the big salary um, but Jeff Bezos that was that was all Amazon equity and so mm -hmm. when it comes to structuring your company thinking about how you build your company and who you bring into the fold of, of who's investing and diversifying that is a way to like really impactfully shape and hopefully for the long term something that restructures societal power I know that's like a really big concept but those are you know a few dimensions of of startup life that I that I think about a few angles that I think about um, my job from that um, you know help propel me forward every day. And something that I think is really beautiful about you as a founder is your willingness to chat with other founders. You know, you've chatted with me a couple times already, and as I told you last week, it's already been so helpful. And I think that's a really beautiful thing about you as a founder is your willingness to help as well. I really appreciate that a lot, but I, I will say that I wouldn't have, you know, the other realization is I wouldn't have gotten even remotely close to where, you know, where we've come today and we still have a long way to go. But without other fellow founders being willing to do that, help me forward, help hop, skip, jump, fast forward, fast track to the next step, because you know, when you're trying to nudge something new into the universe and really change things, it's it's actually really hard. <laughs> and mm -hmm. and talking about like how to how to even take an idea to the next step, and we really to make it possible have to help each other out. I really believe in that. Yeah, same. And that's a great way to lead into the next question, which I think is so important: is what is ugly and hard about being a founder, and how do you stay sane amongst those things? Uh, yeah, I I can pretend like I have all the solutions there, but I I don't. I'm still learning and I'm still figuring it out, to be honest. And I'm yeah, I'm curious about your your thoughts on all these questions as well. But um, I think the day to day psychology is something that can hit founders really hard, and part of that comes from you know the big vision always being always being bigger than the reality that you can achieve tomorrow and so everything feels slower everything gets more expensive and you just can sometimes feel uh, you know overwhelmed with all of the things that that you have to do or dissatisfied with where you're at relative to where you want to be especially when things take and, and actually we as humans are really actually pretty bad at anticipating exactly how long things will take us to get mm -hmm. Just actually mm -hmm. the reality, these are, you can check out, there are many psychological studies on this. We're really generally bad at estimating that. So imagine that for like mm -hmm. a really impatient entrepreneur who wants to get all of this visionary stuff done and it's just like, you know, the yardstick keeps moving out, that goalpost keeps moving out, but you're, you know, just a, a little step of the way relative to, to where it is that you want to be. So you know, we could talk about ways that we can try to combat that. When, when it comes to basic sanity, like literally covering your basics. I think this is something that is so easy for entrepreneurs to forget. And I have to admit, sometimes I forget these things, but when I check some of these basic boxes, sleep, making sure I'm eating right, just basic nutrition, that I'm hydrating, getting that water, and then I get in some exercise. You know, that 
that's definitely those are that's kind of like a special trifecta of things that I'm just like kind of always <laughs> putting at the, at the forefront of my mind if I'm feeling a little bit off. Usually I haven't checked one of those boxes. Mm -hmm. And it helps, it help, actually helps me to stay more than sane when you've gotten a great night of sleep. I mean, and there's just so much. Yeah, I think I'm just probably preaching to the choir here. Um, another thing that's been really helpful for me personally is having a super supportive partner. Um, and I think that just speaks to whether you have a partner or not, whether that's something that is of interest to you, surrounding yourself with people who energize you, who can cheer you on, who, you know, can help, you know, just just check in with you and, and let you know, like, yes, you're going down the right path, or actually, if you're not going down the right path, like, take a step in, the, in a different direction, stop yeah. over this. You know, it's been said that you are the average of the five people that you surround yourself with, and so ensuring that you, you sprinkle that time in the day, literally put it on your calendar if you need to, mm -hmm. uh, spend that time with people who, you know, really uh, energize you in a positive direction is, I think, is crucial. Those are probably the four, the four most critical things to my seminar. Yeah, I agree with you. Oftentimes, people ask me, "How do you get so much done in the day?" You know, like especially with being a founder. And I say, "Well, first of all, I have to sleep well, and that means putting myself to bed, almost like I'm my own parent." You know, like I turn off my devices at a certain time. I try to get myself into bed at a certain time. And then I try to wake up at the same time so that I can start my day and go about my to-do list. Um, for me, I was going to say it's also saving off some loneliness during this time because we're all in our homes and, you know, you said you are, um, you know, amalgamation of the five people that you spend the most time with. And I totally agree with that, especially during this time. I have a few friends that I see constantly and I just, talk to them about ideas or I just listen to what they're doing so I can almost take a brain break as well and, and focus on being empathetic with them or actively listening with them and also fill up my cup, you know, getting oxytocin, which I love. It feels so good. Uh, so that, those are a couple of things I do too, yeah. Uh, I think you hit on something also really important. One thing that sometimes seems a little bit counterintuitive is um, you know that maybe it's some some people call it mentorship but that reciprocal relationship piece where you're helping out somebody and maybe yeah maybe it is through mentoring a friend or just like being there for them and helping to like listen to uh, and listen through their their own issues and problems and struggles and help them to find you know kind of a better uh, maybe it's just simply a better emotional and mental space can actually really fill your cup. It's mm -hmm. sort of potentially counterintuitive because it actually takes energy from you, but it's something that can, you know, for, for people who, and I think most of us do, especially in our entrepreneurial community who care about helping people and, and, and filling other people's cups, it can help us fill our own cups as well. I'm really glad you brought that up. Yeah, yeah, I think you were 100% social animals and we need that interaction and it's hard during this time. We can get it from conversations like this a little bit, but if you have, like you said, you have a wonderfully supportive partner and you love the team that you work with, and that also helps to give us little injections of oxytocin in that sense. The other thing I was going to say is um, I also really enjoy being silly, so I try to just do something silly every day. Like if I have a funny thought in my head, like, you know, I'll just kind of act it out because I think sometimes our imaginations have become dormant. I mean, as founders, we are very creative and we're catching ideas all the time. But then sometimes when I roll down that garage door for Kilo for the day, so to say, I'm like, I got to get out my silliness. Like, maybe I'll dance to a song or I'll, like, be walking around the neighborhood and I'll just start, I don't know, doing something silly. And it feels like such a good release for stress management. Absolutely, yeah, just the concept of play, getting into your inner child. I think one way that I access that too is actually through watching uh, movies, and mm -hmm. so that's definitely, and it helps you to wind down too, like a couple, couple birds with one stone there, but you know, for some of, for me, I can get, I mean, I get really inspired by, we were just watching an anime movie the other night, and 
just the the creativity there was really inspiring to me um or uh, sometimes in the vein of silly like we've just gotten back into watching spongebob squarepants <laughs> and yeah <laughs> and like, oh, like how do they how do these creators just like come up with some of these things that are happening here and you know, just, it's good to laugh and it's just good to get in that like silly child like play zone uh, and to tap yeah. it just like another thing that for sure I mean it keeps me more than sane <laughs> absolutely I love giggling and laughing I, I, I haven't gotten into Spongebob Spongebob Squarepants and I feel like I sound like an old lady saying that but I'm gonna give it a shot now <laughs> I'll um, check it out. I don't even know what Spongebob Squarepants is these days maybe I'm dating myself with the, <laughs> with the references there but they're ridiculously awesome I got really into Rick and Morty for a while, which I loved. I started watching that at the first startup uh -huh. I worked at. We would take breaks, and we would watch it for 30 minutes as a team. We'd be like, it's 3.30, we're going to take a break, we're going to watch an episode together, but people didn't have to. We were in our tiny little sales room. And we would laugh together as a team, and it was really wonderful. There's this an amazing, that you mentioned Rick and Morty, uh, episode or like a meme that has gone around with an episode <laughs> that they compare uh, just like what it's like to be an entrepreneur and they like go through a spaceship they're just like going through space <laughs> with this rocket and like all the all the aliens are like from the dark side are like shooting at them and like the and the opposite rock and they get through and they they make it to the you know this new uh, planet and they get on stage and everybody's like Whoa! and they get these like gold medals and then they retreat back to the spaceship and all of a sudden they like just break down in tears and cry and they're like oh my god we almost died back there they thought like they thought we made it easy like oh and they're just like completely traumatized and yeah that definitely went around at least in my <laughs> circle and it made me get yeah, about cry with with tears of laughter and, <laughs> and commiseration as well. <laughs> I think we're going to have to pull that graphic if we can into this part for the segment of the podcast, which would be so great. <laughs> we totally got to do that. I was going to ask you this question that I often think about, and I wonder what other uh, you know founders think is: How often do you think about mortality, and how does that play out for you? Actually, quite a lot. And it might I don't know, sound a little unexpected since I don't know. I'm kind of like a, I have a, a bubbly personality sometimes, but uh, I think especially with uh, with COVID and a lot of the things that we've seen in the news lately, that is something that recently has re-entered um, people's minds a lot and in a lot of a lot of painful ways. Um, you know, definitely within. Actually, just as I was getting Struck Club started, uh, you know, experiencing um, losses in my own family as well as, uh, you know, very you know, life-threatening situations um, for you know, various members of uh, my family in close circle. And, you know, that has caused um, definitely mortality as, as a theme to re-enter my mind and, and caused me to question, you know, what is it that I really want to be doing with my life hours? I think that is important for really anybody to think about. It's it's one of the ways in which that plays out in my life. Like tomorrow is not a given. So what is it that I can do today? Am I spending my day doing the things that I really feel like I should be doing? And if I were to look back on it, not regret those moments. Um, and I think that actually plays a really important role in um, you know kind of how I prioritize and think about things day to day. I do think it's a it's really, yeah, it is really important to think about. I do too. I, I've done this kind of funny thing. I mean, I, I laugh at it because it is dark, but sometimes I am that way, is I've made a, a playlist of all these songs I'd want my friends to play someday when I die because I will die. I don't think in our lifetime we're going to upload our consciousness into the cloud personally. You know, I don't think that, but. I have a playlist, and whenever I hear a song that I just love, I love 80s music, so I'll put that on the playlist. Or I'll say to my friends, like, what would you, what would you say, you know, if, if you were, you know, speaking at uh, my funeral or my celebrating life? 
Uh, and they're like, that's so weird, Bender. Like, why are you asking me about that? I'm like, well, it helps me be more present, you know, by having these conversations with my friends. And it allows me to reflect more on exactly like you said, like throughout the day, did I end my day uh, with no regrets, with really telling people that I loved them and sharing my ideas and really listening to other people. It's actually quite motivating instead of it being uh, debilitating in some way because it's, because I'm afraid of it. I find the same. And I, I think that, I mean, that's actually a really deep technique to think about, you know, to your point of what is it that people will say during the eulogy about you? What will your epitaph that you're not writing say about you mm -hmm. and what you want it to say? And are you doing things today that align with what you want those, those people and those, you know, literally lines written about you to, to say about you? So as a thought experiment, what would you, what would you want yours to say? Oh my gosh, it's freaking deep. <laughs> um, <laughs> my life missions really is to be a light in, in people's lives. So you only have so much room. It's like, it's yeah. just fit. But if I can, if I can achieve that, if I can, if I can get there, there's just a lot of things about, <laughs> about life. And I, I mean, you know, we talk about mortality and that's like pretty dark, but, um, you know, there are other, even just like things day to day that weigh heavily on people. If I can lighten that load, if I can, you know, shine a light into that, then, and, and it starts with, you know, actions that we think are pretty small and they're not, you know, they're not necessarily to small to, to other people that you might be interacting with. And if you neglect or if you overlook those simple things, like, you know, how you treat people, the words that you choose, whether or not you choose to say thank you, as an example, uh, those actually, those are really big statements. Mm -hmm. And I think also when you are light, you, sometimes you don't even know it till months or years later or days later and someone writes you a thank you or you hear from someone else like, oh, this, this person said, you know, Amira helped me in this way. And it's so encouraging when you realize that you're acting out your purpose or your passion and other people are affected by it and you don't even realize it. It's like a really wonderful thing. Yeah, that's uh, that definitely when you have a like second, third degree level of impact on, yeah, maybe even people you don't even know. That's pretty powerful. Mm-hmm. I totally agree. And then last but not least, uh, are there any like wonderful books you're reading or quotes you love or poems that are go-to to, I don't know, shine a light on kind of when you're feeling dark or when you like need some motivation or something you just enjoy going to to like bring a smile to your face? Oh, there are so many things. Um, for work, I definitely have you know, kind of, we have a team channel and that centers um, our, our customers and people who, you know, our workouters, our struct clubbers, our wolf pack, uh, and just the, the ways in which they're impacted by the work that we're doing. Uh, and so that's just a, a day brightener just from a day-to-day a, a -day working perspective. From a, a broader perspective, I mean, there's so many books. Um, I'm reading like two to three books right now between like hard books and audio books. Um, one of them, which I, yeah, shamefully have been procrastinating on for a while just because of the other books I was reading and was getting through those, um, is The Hard Thing About Hard Things. I've got, I'm, you know, getting deeper into um, the canon of uh, anti-racism books that I haven't touched on yet. Um, so I'm reading um, Ibram X. Ken Kendi's um, How to Be an Anti-Racist, that's one that I'm progressing through uh, just about at the end of, uh, and those are definitely books that I would highly recommend. I don't know, maybe I should make a list somewhere we could tag it in the show notes because they're just yeah, yeah. too many things. Um, if I'm surfing around Instagram, I find, yeah, anything I can find on Serena Williams is like really inspiring to me. It definitely fits with the fitness theme or sometimes Oprah memes enter my universe and there's this like one video that she has about this is your life 
own your life. It's your life. And sometimes that just like kicks me back into <laughs> reality. Sometimes when you feel like things are out of control or you're like, shoot, like this is not going the way that I want, um, you know, kind of like reclaiming uh, and like standing in your own power, which you do have and using that to propel you forward is one of those other things that it lights the lights the match under my butt, so to speak. I like that, lights the match under your butt. <laughs> I too feel very inspired by Serena Williams. How how do you feel like she inspires you? Oh my gosh. There I mean just there's so many dimensions and now I mean beyond being just you know her and Venus being just on having an unbelievable life story growing up and just kind of to and, and totally dominating in the tennis arena um, and just completely changing the game, pun intended, there for so many people. Um, she's also turned into, actually both of them have turned into entrepreneurs uh, and investors. And so then using this um, power that you have created to then give back and to proliferate, you know, a new vision for what entrepreneurship and the economy and products and services should look like is, I just think, incredible role modeling and, you know, just a, an approach that I hope, um, you know, more people who, who have, who of course, have that passion for innovation and technology and entrepreneurship do to pay it forward, invest in the next generation, um, and you know, any time, like any interview, any podcast, any Instagram post that she's talking about something, she is so graceful and at the same time extremely motivating. That definitely you know, is fueled from an athletic background and extensive mm -hmm. athletic training for her whole life, but I... You know, that that approach and, and the way that she talks about things is motivating and inspiring to me. And I also think that when I do feel like things get hard as an entrepreneur, I look to those quotes and inspirational figures like Serena, for example, to be like, okay, like I can do this another day. Like she's crushing it. I liked what you said about Oprah, like own it. Exactly. Like those are things that also help busing. So Amira, how can people find you on their pocket computers and larger computers? <laughs> so um, you can DM me directly on IG, Amira Pollock, A-M-I-R-A, P-O-L-A-C-K, or at Struck Club, um, S-T-R-U-C-T-C-L-U-B. You can grab our app again for free on the App Store. It's Struct Club on the App Store. Um, my personal email is Amira, A-M-I-R-A, at StructClub.com. So you can reach me there, too. All kinds of ways to reach me. LinkedIn, I'll answer that, too. Yes. I'm going to do a quick shout-out to Startup Hut, uh, who is also working with Kilo to develop and produce this podcast. Startup Hut dedicates itself to democratizing access and eliminating geographical barriers to a diverse community of like-minded founders, mentors, and investors dedicated to building successful startups. Startup Hut organizes live streamed virtual pitch events, and they are building an online community of entrepreneurs that can leverage a network of investors, mentors, and partners, and access community perks and resources. If you are interested in pitching at one of their future pitch events or partnering with Startup Hut, please contact George at thestartuphut.com for more information. And you can find Kilo on your pocket computer or larger computer at www.kilo.app on Instagram at kilo.app. Uh, thanks so much, Amira. I know that we'll continue to chat, and uh, I really have appreciated you spending time with us today. So be well, everybody. Bye for now, uh, and mahalo. Thanks. See ya. <laughs>